I did not see criminals. I did not see gang members. Population explosion, the Homestead Detention Shelter for Migrant Teens will grow by a thousand beds to more than 3,000 and Representative Debbie Mooker Sal Powell isn't happy about it. She's with us to explain. I've never betrayed my oath of office. I've never tarnished the badge. Suing to be sheriff. Scott Israel keeps fighting his suspension. The governor says, bring it on. Security scare at Mar-a-Lago. A Chinese woman talks her way into the president's private club, carrying lots of electronic devices, social climber or spy. We will take that question to the round table. Good Sunday morning. Great to be with you today. And we begin with the controversy over the detention center in Homestead, holding a growing number of teens, mostly from Central America, who cross the border by themselves. About 2,000 of those teens now are being held at the facility, which is run by a private contractor for the government. And now they're going to add another 1,200 beds. It looks like the kids are being held uh, in a humane way. They're treated humanely, but essentially it's a jail and a very expensive one. It costs $750 a day for each teenager in custody. Might be cheaper to put them up at the Ritz-Carlton. Protesters stand outside that shelter daily, demanding that it be closed and that the teens be freed, sent to family members or sponsors. Echoing that call, most South Florida lawmakers, including the Democrat who represents that district, Debbie Mukarsel Powell. And that is where we begin our conversation with her this week. Congresswoman, thanks so much for being here this Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for Good having morning. me. Good morning. We're glad you're here. All right. The Detention center down in Homestead is in your district. It has now about 2,000 young unaccompanied minors cross the border by themselves. It's going to ramp up to more than 3,000 of these kids down there, ages 13 to 17. Are you concerned about that? Uh, Michael, this has been the darkest cloud, I think, that's weighing heavily on me because it is in my community, in my district. <clears throat> in a city that should be thriving, and, and it is thriving, Homestead. And I had a meeting with some of the Homestead officials, and they were never consulted when they reopened that facility in Homestead. Nobody in Homestead wants to have that detention facility. I wanted to start with that. But as you know, and Glenna was there the day that I toured the Homestead facility detention center, there are over 1,600 kids that are being held. It feels like, for me, it felt like a prison. They're fed, they have beds, but they can only speak with family members twice a week for five minutes. Yeah. And some of them have been there for months with no real um, uh, hope for reunification anytime soon. So when I saw that announcement, it was definitely demoralizing and I'm very frustrated and I'm, at, I'm going to be asking very tough questions. Uh, from this administration. So the essential question about that <coughs> detention facility, and we've, we've spent a lot of time there. There are people who spend a lot of their own lives standing vigil outside. And I thought so much about this, and I think the essential question is, here is such a vulnerable population of migrants without family. What is the best case scenario for that number of people who are in government custody, responsibility, to care for them, to make them happy, the least restrictive as they go through the process. What else can you do? If not this, then what? That's the question. It's a very good question. And we had a hearing on family separation a few weeks ago in the Judiciary Committee, which I'm a part of. And the level of incompetence is very serious because a lot of the agencies, From what's Homeland happening. Homeland Security yes, or so, Office so, of Refugee so Resettlement? Had, we had ORR, yeah. we had Department of Health and Human Services, we had ICE, we had uh, Border Patrol, and there's definitely a lot of miscommunication. They were ordered to separate kids at the border. We also see a lot of unaccompanied children come without family members, which in, is in what you're referring to. Instead, they're unaccompanied. Those aren't separated children anymore. There were I some actually, there. I'm going okay. to challenge you on that because when I was Do there you in have February, that information? I spoke with one young girl specifically when I was there. Yeah. And she, I asked her, how long have you been here? She told me nine months. And I said, what happened when, and she said, well, my mother and I were separated ah, at the so border. That goes to the and miscommunication. Mother, and exactly. exactly. And her mm -hmm. mother 
has been deported and all she wants is to be with her mom. She doesn't want to be in this detention facility. So part of the problem is that there's not a lot of communication. There's a lot of incompetence and they've hired this company, a for-profit company to manage this detention facility. Right. They're charging about $750 per child to be held there. Per so day. Th there's not an incentive, Michael. Yeah. When I see the request for more beds, for a thousand more beds, what message are we sending in this country? What are we doing? So yeah. again, they have a process that they're going through. There are, uh, to your point, there are kids who I've been told have been there a hundred days because this list of numbers and phone numbers and sponsors that they are coming to be with don't, don't check out. There are people who leave in two days because they do. So this process of finding appropriate and safe sheltering for these children, which is really where they should go, how do, how do we get there? Is it more immigration judges? Is it more caseworkers? What, what is the answer of getting them to the place in those kind of numbers where they can be safe and secure in this process? So it's all of that. But just to correct the record one more time, when I was there, I realized and I learned that case managers that are following the kids and the reunification pro process are not able to speak with the immigration attorneys that are representing the kids. So. I would love for us to have a more, I know, I know, you, I am not making this up. You should talk to immigration attorneys that are working in the center. And part of the problem is that there's not that, there's no communication. We don't have enough immigration attorneys that are representing these kids. There are parts of the process that don't make sense to me. There's a young, uh, young man, he must be 14, 15, that I spoke with and then I later asked the immigration attorney, her, his father is living in California. He has been going through the process of reunification and apparently his fingerprints expired and so he was asked to start the process again. So whatever is going on, whether it's investing in more case managers, allowing them to, to work closely with immigration attorneys, investing in more resources for immigration judges, we need to do it. And are you, as a, as a congresswoman, you know, we talked before the show, you're in the thought process of what can we do in Congress? What, what can you do? There is this letter from uh, DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen. I'm not sure whether you saw that letter yet, but it was essentially you know, putting up the red flags. We have a system-wide meltdown. The numbers mm -hmm. are overwhelming. We need more congressional funding and resources. It sounds like she's speaking to the choir. Exactly. And I want to remind the secretary that we actually appropriated over $200 million to go directly to Border Patrol and uh, after the shutdown that was part of our appropriations process. We have asked for funding to support uh, the shelters so that we don't just hold immigrants in shelters without any form of uh, health care services or appropriate lodging so that we actually provide them with humane care. So we have appropriated those funds. Yeah. and. You know, instead of talking about, what was it? I'm forgetting the figure now, $5 billion for a wall. We need to appropriate funding. I support her request for border patrol agencies to be funded. We do support funding for these shelters to be able to uh, take on the influx of immigrants. Immigration is a serious problem, but I, I have to tell you that the way that they're being processed is also a serious concern of mine. And we have to have the conversation of immigration reform. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, the letter that Glenna referred to that Secretary uh, DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen sent also talked about the possibility of deporting these unaccompanied minors who cannot prove that they have a legal right to stay in the U.S. Well, that's a high bar to reach because they're really, they have very few rights uh, to, to stay in the U.S. Part of the problem has been that we are not allowing to the process of asylum and refugee requests. And that's where you see the backlog. That's where you see this critical number going up, you know, every, every day as we're seeing in the border. I have to tell you that one of the things that I wanted to understand is where are we with the level of immigration coming to our southern border? Because I keep hearing yeah. from you know the president, Secretary Nielsen, we have a crisis. We do have a problem of immigration. I will not deny that, but it's not a crisis. They have created this crisis by not processing the asylum requests. A hundred, excuse me, a hundred thousand 
people this month are going to try to cross into the United States. That's as high as it's been in a decade. That's a lot of people coming into the country. It is, and I have to also tell you that just this week we were talking with the ambassador from Mexico on how we can help Mexico alleviate this problem, how we can help the Southern Triangle alleviate the problem. It's not taking funding away from those countries. Yeah. These people are desperate, they're fleeing violence, poverty. I'm not saying we should you know, open our doors, welcome everyone. Obviously, that's not my position. Obviously, we have to have a secure border. But there are so many ways to deal with this issue. Not allowing anyone to be processed is not the answer. So the metering that they're implementing now, at least in Tijuana, is not a good idea. I mean, if you're, they have thousands of these migrants waiting in Tijuana, if you process 75, 100 a day, you're never going to allow these people to come in. No, exactly. And one of the conversations that the Mexican ambassador mentioned to me is that they were talking to the United States that they would take a certain number of immigrants to some of their shelters, that they can't take them all, yeah. and that they also have an asylum request process, and, but that they're not getting the number of immigrants that they expected from the United States. So something is happening there. There's, yeah. again, miscommunication. All right, all right. well, yeah. hold, hold your thoughts. We have yeah. a lot more to yes. talk about yes. with <laughs> you, including your service on the Judi Judiciary Committee That's and the right. Mueller report. Stay with us. We'll be back with Representative Debbie Mukher Sal Powell in just a minute. Welcome back this morning. We are speaking with Congresswoman Debbie Mukherjee Powell from the 26th Congressional District, South Miami-Dade, all the way down to Key West. Congresswoman, you served on the House Judiciary Committee, mm -hmm. chaired by Gerald Nadler of New York, kind of an experienced, tough guy, smart guy. And the committee, through Mr. Nadler now, is asking for the complete Mueller report. Have you issued subpoenas to get it? Will you? The first step that we took in the Judiciary Committee was just asking for the release of the full report directly to Attorney General Barr. When we got a four-page letter, we that wasn't really explaining to us what was in that report. We later realized that we have 
a report that includes three to 400 pages. So asking for it, not receiving it, what we did was hold a hearing this past week that allows the committee, allows the chairman to subpoena the report if we don't receive it. We are taking it one day at a time. I know that the chairman is giving the attorney general the, the time frame and giving him the benefit of the doubt that he will give us that report without having to use the subpoena power, but if we yeah. don't receive it in a timely manner, we may need to do that. You know, that memo allowed the administration to really set the narrative of what the report shows, and in, in just the last couple of days, there have been reports that some of the staffers that worked on the report actually wrote public versions that we haven't seen, and that's that was kind of surprising, frankly, to me. What do you make of that? Um, I don't understand what the fear is, Glenna. When I was in the hearing just trying to get subpoena power, we weren't saying that we were going to use the subpoena, just that the committee will have that power to use it if need be. You should have seen the reaction from my friends across the aisle. It, it, there's, there's some sort of fear, hesitation. I don't understand what it is. but. Attorney General Barr should be able to give us that report with those summaries that you just mentioned today if he decides to do so. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about an issue dear to you and to the constituents uh, whom you serve, which is health care, health insurance. In Florida, 1.7 million people are enrolled right now in Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. The president last week uh, said, we're going to be the party of health care, we're going to repeal Obamacare. Then apparently Senator Mitchell said, not so fast, we're not going to take it up until after the election. But what can you say to your constituents who are maybe very, very scared that they're going to lose their the health coverage they have? Well, I understand their fear because all they hear from the administration and the Republicans is this attack on the Affordable Care Act. In my community, in my district, we have over 100,000 people that get their health care through the ACA, 300,000 living with pre-existing conditions. The ACA was created to ensure that we had protections for those people living with pre-existing conditions. And what they're doing is slowly stripping away at those protections. What I can tell you is that they have someone in Washington that's fighting for them. Uh, I want everyone to understand that when I go there, when I leave my kids here and I travel to Washington, D.C., my commitment is, why am I here? What am I doing? I'm working for the people that elected me. Healthcare is a top priority. And so we introduced the making affordable um, care, making healthcare affordable and protecting people with pre-existing conditions act, which makes sure that in this piece of legislation, we reduce costs. We don't allow for the administration and the states to sell junk plans, which they're very tricky. They are right now being allowed to sell these plans mm -hmm. that don't cover you if you have to be hospitalized, don't cover your prescription drug medicines. So we are making sure that we work on reducing premiums, number one. Everyone complains about premiums. I complain about premiums uh, and reducing costs of prescription drugs, but also protecting those pre-existing conditions. So is this meant as a replacement? Should the Affordable Health Care Act be struck down as unconstitutional? I, I think that I think that it has a lot of problems. It shouldn't be struck down. I don't think it should now be struck down. Now that they've taken out the individual mandate, I'm trying to fi <laughs> well, follow there are the a lot, court there, filings. Yes, and, yeah. and, it's, and it's funny, Glenna, because I ask my uh, staff uh, member who's an attorney to tell me exactly what's going on yeah. because it's confusing. Complicated. There, there are a lot of lawsuits. Um, a lot of the district courts are having, you know, they're they're refusing to allow the 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 repeal of Af the Affordable Care Act. There's another court that says that maybe it is unconstitutional. So, at this moment, what we can do in Congress is protect that health care for and pre-existing conditions. Yes. All right, uh, Congresswoman, <laughs> let me ask you. Um, kind of a strictly political question about uh, former Vice President Joe Biden. He's having his Me Too moment, you know, and you've seen the video in which he says, I get it, I've invaded people's personal space, women's personal space, and I'll stop it. Uh, is, does this in any way, the seven or so women who have come forward saying he made me uncomfortable, he said something, touched me in a way that I didn't like, does that disqualify him as a candidate? Very good question, and I have been thinking about this all week since I saw the first allegations. I can tell you that I've met the vice president a couple of times, and he seems to me like a man of integrity, someone that is warm. He is, he, I've seen him give hugs to men and yeah. women, but it's also very important to allow women to come forward and say that they felt um, uncomfortable. 
it's very different to to come and say he touched me in a way that I didn't feel comfortable it was in a public space and we need to make sure that we don't draw the same conclusions from someone that has been sexually harassed right. violated assaulted so I think it's important that the vice president is listening to the women and I look forward to hearing him talk a little bit more if he decides to run for president. All right, back to policy. You are now yeah. vice chair of the, it's a really long name, water and environmental water. resources it's an of name, the very transportation yeah. and infrastructure <clears throat> committee. <clears throat> uh, that's why there are acronyms yeah. in Washington. <laughs> but in any case, it's all about yeah. the environment. And um, were, you were in at Lake Okeechobee on Friday with the president, were you? No, um, I think it was only Republicans that he invited. Yeah, so we, we have a little clip of the president who was there to talk about how he would be funding uh, the H Herbert Hoover dike restoration, et cetera, and took a little, he took a little turn. So let's listen to the president from last Friday. And I'll tell you something, Columbia, you have your new president of Columbia, really good guy. I met him. We had him at the White House. He said how he's going to stop drugs. More drugs are coming out of Colombia right now than before he was president. So he has done nothing for us. So the president took a turn from the environment to immigration. And uh, just to recap, in case Congresswoman, you couldn't hear that, he talked about how Colombian President Ivan Duque just has dropped the ball on helping the U.S. in the drug interdiction and drug flow. Um, you met with that president to do what afterwards? Diplomatic well, we actually, repairs? We, we, we had a phone conversation that Saturday. I had met the president a, a month before that, I think, in Washington, D.C. He was visiting. And, you know, I'm an immigrant. I came from Ecuador. I understand Latin American politics very well. And it was when I heard those comments, I knew immediately that he that it, they were going to be offensive and disheartening. And so I had the phone conversation. The president told me that it affected him deeply because when you hear the president of the United States, we are still uh, one of the most powerful nations in the world. And what happens here matters and it has an effect to Latin American policy. He's fighting the war on drugs. What he needs is support from us, Duque. you know, not, mm -hmm. not criticism. And he's welcomed a million and a half Venezuelan refugees. We need to learn from his policies his humane policies and help him. He's helping us by welcoming those Venezuelan refugees. So comments like that can further destabilize the region. We need to have friends. Like the Secretary General from NATO who came to visit us last week mm -hmm. in DC said when he was addressing the joint members of Congress, he said, you know, it is good to have friends. And I'm in agreement with that. We are glad you came in this morning. Thank you very much. We only have Several pages more of questions. <laughs> yeah. But you'll come back. I'll on come another, back. On I'll another back. occasion, yeah. we'll get to him. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And when we come back, the roundtable takes on the big news of the week. Stay tuned.
Okay. This week, as always, was another confusing mashup of events and speeches, legislation, posturing. So let's try to put it in perspective. Powerhouse Roundtable is here to take it all on. We kind of started in the commercial break anyway, but let me introduce you. Rick Christie is the editorial page editor of the Palm Beach Post. Mary Lee Cancio is an attorney with her own named firm in Miami and active in the Republican Party. David Smiley is a political reporter for the Miami Herald. Welcome. Great to have you all Thank here. You. Thank Marley, you. Good to see you, okay. Rick and David. David, let me begin with you. There is a story of the moment that we need to talk about, about the detention shelter for the migrant kids down in Homestead. Our three Democratic members of Congress from South Florida, Debbie Mukherjee Powell, whom we just heard from, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Donna Shalala, have said they want to tour that facility and they have been told they wanted to do it Monday and they were told by HHS, no, you can't. You can't come in. And apparently there is, according to Debbie Wasserman Schultz, an amendment to an existing law that says legally they can right. go in, but they're being kept out. So where, where do things well, stand? 2019 feels a lot like 2018 right now when uh, the federal government reopened this facility, which initially um, is a tempor temporary facility, was initially opened under the Obama administration when we saw uh, five or six years ago, a rush of unaccompanied migrant children on the border. Right. And last year, when the Trump administration reopened this facility, around the same time that um, they began the very controversial family separation policy, this was uh, a highly politicized facility. We saw a lot of politicians, Democratic politicians, trying to visit the facility, yeah. being rejected, and Congress changed the law. Yeah. And Carlos Curbelo, then a congressman from Republican, right. tried to visit was turned away, but then he eventually did get in. Right, so um, I think this underscores how um, politicized this facility is. Uh, we are a very prominent and important um, uh, melting pot in the country, and here you have the only temporary uh, unaccompanied uh, children's shelter in the country run by a for-profit company. Right. Uh, and it is uh, expanding for the second time, doubling in size to uh, a 3,200 capacity that, uh, if it's filled for an entire year, would cost around $900 million wow. to run. So You know, we were talking earlier, Mary Lee, I was going to say, Mary Lee brought up, like, I, I love when you do math because it really <laughs> hammers at home. Well, the, because with that money, almost $900 million, what, $750 a day per child, yeah. it's over $260,000 per kid. I mean, imagine that kind of money, what they can do with the Northern Triangle of Central America in those mm -hmm. countries, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. Because not, right now we're talking about removing funds because right. their governments are not doing enough to keep them from leaving the country. Because that money that we give those countries is to eliminate corruption, to, you know, to f make a better life for them. But if they're still coming here and we're spending that kind of money, it's crazy. And you know, Rick, the, what's really important to note is in this grand scheme of years and years, because this is, it, I mean, immigration from the southern border is not a new problem. Mm -hmm. But what is new, according to, by all accounts, everyone involved, is that it's no longer a mass of single men looking for work as much as families and women and children escaping what I think Jay Johnson had called a, a burning house, mm -hmm. such danger and poverty and, and drug cartel run governments in Central America. Right, and, and uh, again, this is, this is just a, a, a microcosm of the problem with our entire immigration system where we have issues from the way we treat Caribbean, different Caribbean nations differently. Um, uh, and in Europe where we allow people to routinely overstay, uh, overstay visas to, to what we're now experiencing on the U.S.-Mexico uh, US border. And, uh, and, and as, long as, we, uh, as long as we don't come to some type of agreement that, first of all, this needs to be fixed. And, but I think the word that's missing a lot of times, or probably the word that they fight over, uh, uh, and nobody really says it, is being humane. And what you're talking about when you're talking about families now and everything, yeah. it takes a good deal more humanity than is already built yeah. into our system. Yeah. Well, any mental health expert would tell you as humanely, I think these kids, Glenna has been through this facility, I mean, they are not mistreated, but to be yeah. separated from yeah. your family for any length of time, and the average, I think, stay there is 
said to be 52 days. Some kids stay longer, but I mean, imagine being separated from your children Absolutely. for or, or grandchildren. months. Ima yeah. yeah, horrible. And to be in a massive facility right. like this, 3,200 children yeah. potentially, which yeah. is larger than Homestead Senior High, or at least its capacity, hmm. um, you know, you, you have the potential to be lost in an institution where right. advocates are saying, we're, we're seeing an unprecedented rush of children on the border. Uh, you have to have some place to put them, but in a facility of that size, of that nature, is that the right thing to and do? And you get the sense when you talk to some of them that they, you know, these are really hopeful kids. They feel like this is a good place mm -hmm. as a starting point and something better is coming soon <laughs> when everyone outside the walls doesn't really know what's right. going to happen with those kids. Yeah, part of this problem apparently is the bureaucracy, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, HHS, and the private contractor. Uh, Marley, I mean, there are some family members of these kids who are not documented, they're in the country. They're afraid to come forward to say, my nephew is there and I will take care of him or her because if I go in, I'm afraid they're going to fingerprint me or know that I'm not in the country legally. Yeah. I mean, that's government bureaucracy. Uh, what we're seeing there is that we're letting the government take care of these children. They would be much better off with their families. Imagine sure. 260000 a month to keep these kids there. <laughs> Half a million dollars. I mean, for, for a fraction of that, they would have their own home in their own country and be secure. You know, it was a really, um, a lot of people found a very troubling moment this week at, at Homestead when we were there. Uh, the protesters who keep a daily vigil there spotted John Kelly on a golf cart right away. We got a glimpse of him, uh, confirmed that he was on mm -hmm. a tour there. John Kelly, of course, the ex-Chief of Staff, ex-DHS Secretary. Ex-lobbyist for Caliburn. Right, and that's what people mm. find so troubling is that he was on the board of essentially the parent company mm -hmm. of the contractor now running the place. And the whole for-profit aspect of it is, you know, me, truthfully, in fairness, may or not be in play, but it, it sure does seem like it. And that's, I think, troubling a lot of people. Yeah, it, definitely. So. Well, let's talk a little bit. We had all, during the break, have been talking about immigration reform and how uh, it is so desperately needed. I mean, the Homestead Shoulder is one example. So we're going to take a brief break. When we come back, we will talk about immigration. You'll hear from the president.
<laughs> Welcome back to the round table. We are here with Rick Christie of the Palm Beach Host, Post, uh, Marilee Cancio, Miami attorney and Republican Party activist, and David Smiley, who's probably in PA. He is the <laughs> political he's reporter a, he's a news for, the, activist. for the Miami Herald. Well, let's talk we as we have been during the break about immigration. The president on Friday before he went to Calexico um, talked as he left the White House about the immigration s system. He said asylum is a scam. Let's hear what the president had to say. Congress has to act. They have to get rid of catch and release, chain migration, visa lottery. They have to get rid of the whole asylum system because it doesn't work. And frankly, we should get rid of judges. You can't have a court case every time somebody steps their foot on our ground. So taking, let, okay, let's just do this. Let's take the political out of this. As difficult as, you know, President Trump has his way of talking. David, everybody on, from every party agrees immigration is broken. I mean, that's, that's kind of a bipartisan look. Mm -hmm. So what, where, where is the breakdown to fix immigration? I, I think politics right now is so much about winning that accomplishing and compromise have completely gone by the wayside. If you look at the two government shutdowns, or maybe it's been more, I don't know, uh, <laughs> but going back to 2018, um, there, are, there were things that seemed to be on the table and rejected uh, in 2018 that that you know maybe in 2019 uh, uh, or they would have taken um, or, or, uh, or in the last shutdown, um, and I think that you know the the party that's in control um, oftentimes doesn't want to agree to a compromise to the party that's not, and the Democrats don't want Trump to get a victory, the Republicans don't want the Democrats to get a victory, and, and it gets and in the way. And I agree with what he's saying, and I think the biggest losers so far have been the Dreamers because mm -hmm. the majority of the population agreed that the dreamer should be given legal status. Right. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands of young lives that now have their own children in this country that still live in limbo. And the majority of the voters would support a compromise on dreamers. And, and we have stopped talking about them. Well, during Rick, one of the first Rick's shutdowns. Expression well, I just think that they could have done that under Barack Obama and they didn't do it. So, uh, but I think, but overall you're right. It's, it's, this is too politicized now. And uh, and uh, I'd actually I wish I could, had a magic wand to say, okay, boy, how do we how do we fix this? Thing? I think a lot of people one, wish you did too. It, <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing I found curious was in, in the president's uh, statements at the very end there about catch and release and and, yeah. and asylum and immigration judges. Almost at the very end, I thought, boy, was he changing? Is he ready to change our policy towards Cuba? You know, when he said, just because you set a step foot in this country doesn't mean you ought to be here, which is a policy we've had for quite a while. You know, and so that shows you that there needs to be a lot more thinking uh, and uh, about how we want to re really do uh, immigration yeah. reform. And the biggest thing that I probably disagree with him on in that in that group of things, and I don't know how uh, how you guys feel about this, is that we do need more immigration judges. So that these we cases, do. so yeah. that these cases yeah. can be processed, whether they, whether they, yeah, whether they are allowed the in or not, yeah. you need to process these cases because, and uh, and I do yeah. believe we need a lot more immigration. I just, judges. I just saw in a little research I did the average wait time for somebody who is granted an asylum application to get before a judge seven hundred and sixty three days. <laughs> seven hundred yeah. and sixty three days. It's going to take even longer for the valid asylum seekers to get a hearing. Right, uh, right. Yes, yesterday I had my nails done by a lady that is from Venezuela. <laughs> they look yeah. very lovely. Thank you. Yeah. And the, but the lady <laughs> is here uh, with her husband and her two kids and they have been waiting for two years to wow. get a hearing. They have not so heard anything. Like yeah. and, they and that's not move. an unusual exactly. amount of time and at Venezuelans all. Venezuelans And they're hoping for TPO. And I agree. Yeah. Can, yeah, can, I, can I switch gears here for a little bit because this week David Smiley had what I think we could all agree the headline of the week. Pardon me when I read it, because I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> Only in Florida could a billionaire's massage parlor pit stop unmask a possible spy ring. <laughs> you win. <laughs> you win for that. So, um, but, you know, all kidding aside, serious concerns about security at Mar-a-Lago. Explain. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, 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 the president's uh, uh, business at Mar-a-Lago, uh, the ability of, um, of people to... Uh, for a fee or a, a political contribution 
obtain access to the president or high-level politicians um, is becoming, I think at this point, a security concern without a doubt. Um, and we have seen over the last month or six weeks reporting uh, by my colleagues at the Miami Herald that has shown um, that you know what started with uh, uh, reporters poking around New England Patriots uh, owner Robert Kraft's uh, arrest at the Orchids of Asia Day Spa uh, in, uh, in, in, was it January? Um, uh, uh, has turned into this sort of bizarre web of connections. So how does the woman from this, who owned this, this, mm -hmm. um, it's Cindy, a, Yang. Cindy, Yang, Cindy Yang, who right. was shown, place, shown yeah. in yeah. selfies with President Trump, how is she connected to this other woman, Eugene Zhang, who right. appeared at Mar-a-Lago this weekend right. with all kinds of laptops and hard drives and, and uh, purportedly malware on a thumb drive? How did, who got mm -hmm. into Mar-a-Lago? Right. How well, are they connected? Cindy Yang, who founded the day spa where Robert Kraft was uh, caught on video and then eventually charged, um, we found her because she happened to take a selfie with Trump the night of the Super Bowl where Robert Kraft's team was winning. <laughs> and then in looking at her, we found that she wow. uh, was uh, in a number of pictures with a number of politicians, Matt Gates, yeah. Ron DeSantis, to name yeah. a few. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and this is because um, she had created a consultancy of uh, bringing in uh, uh, people from China uh, for a fee to attend, uh, to buy tickets and uh, get at, you know, to, at two events at Mar-a-Lago and to hopefully get access to Donald Trump or members of his family yeah. to talk about their businesses. And uh, her connection to this woman who was arrested at Mar-a-Lago for allegedly lying to federal agents and trespassing is that this woman who was arrested was said she was there to attend an event that Cindy Yang was right. promoting right. on Chinese social media. So we, we talk a lot about Russian influence. Yeah. I think we need to worry a lot about more about China. Chinese <laughs> influence. Well, as <laughs> our oh, friends oh, Carl Hassan and Dave Berry would say, you can't make this stuff up, <laughs> you know, and it's going to appear a good reporting by you and your colleagues at the Herald. All right, more roundtable after a break.
Welcome back. We are in the midst of a really robust roundtable here. And Rick Christie, Mar-a-Lago is in your backyard. Palm Beach Post covers, yeah. you know, um, obviously what, what goes on there. And uh, the strange kind of dissonance, cognitive dissonance, what goes on there and access of the president and others happened, I guess, when Tokyo Prime Minister Abe was there having a dinner in the patio, and yeah. then they learned about nuclear testing by <laughs> North Korea. Korea. I mean, you know, missile testing. And, um, but no, this, that was where it started, yeah. I mean, that's how it started, but it mm -hmm. keeps going on. Yeah, and uh, as we were talking about, uh, that, um, that it all, that first security, big security questions came up with that when there was, uh, when the president was, uh, was hosting Prime Minister Abe. Uh, and there was, and then he got a phone call that North Korea about North Korea missile testing. And, people and instead of him leaving, yeah, instead of him leaving and going off to a room to talk about yeah. this very sensitive foreign policy issue, he was just there, and people were like taking pictures. Yeah. And then there was another incident a week after that where uh, I think Jeff Sessions was caught mixing and mingling with certain guests and everything. This is the former Attorney General, yeah. and which was also a security issue. And so there have been a few things after that, and I think. What we have seen is that there's a look, the culture was kind of established from the very beginning about access to the president. Uh, when you uh, look at Mar-a-Lago, when uh, I think a mess, clear message was sent when they doubled the uh, doubled the membership free from one hundred thousand to, to two hundred thousand. Right. Okay, why would you pay two hundred thousand? Well, because I expect to have some access to the president of the United States. So I think they established sort of that culture of access. Uh, from the very beginning with yeah. this private club. Well, it may have to change with Zhu Jing Zhang. Well, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, that, I think now they, because the Chinese or anybody else, uh, 200,000 bucks to get access to the president? Well, that's, I think, well, the Secret know, that's Service. Trump change. Yeah, and, and initially there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, questions from the Democrats on the Hill, you know, in terms of what is the Secret Service doing? Is, yeah. the, well, is this and place secure? Those questions yeah, and, again. yeah, and they are, and, uh, but they seem to be satisfied by like Thursday or Friday, I think, the Secret Service has satisfied them that they were doing everything that they could do yeah. or should be doing. Yeah. The issue is Mar-a-Lago and the private facilities themselves. Yeah. Remember, the president president also has two golf courses, one in Jupiter and one in West Palm Beach that he right. attends on a regular basis playing right. a lot of golf. And, and, uh, and at Durrell down, uh, down here in Miami-Dade, or down in Miami-Dade. So the, the issue really now going forward in terms of, uh, of security is what they need to do at these private places that the president goes to. I mean, there's, I think he even goes to play golf maybe in Scotland or is it New Jersey? Yeah. Uh, I all think right. there's a place Be in New Jersey. Before we run out of time, Sorry. Uh, we, no, that's all right, you, you're on point. But we do want to mention the fact that uh, former Broward Sheriff uh, Scott Israel lost his court case this week. Mm -hmm. um, and now he says he's going to appeal to the Fourth District Court of Appeal. But Martin Lee, while this is going on, whatever Senate hearing is all on hold, I mean, and it really doesn't legally look promising for the sheriff. It, it doesn't, but it, I think it's a political matter that he wants to continue fighting. Governor DeSantis, uh, I think, who's doing a very good job, has taken the high road and says, you know, he hasn't gotten the message uh, <laughs> speaking about Sheriff Israel. Well, yeah. the, right. the governor, you <laughs> he know, hasn't gotten the message. The, the governor's suspension cited negligence and uh, dereliction of duty, pretty much. Um, and so what the governor did after the sheriff's case was dismissed was say, hey, let's get it right up to the Florida Supreme Court pretty yeah. quickly. He's so confident that the court system is going to side with him and then it will Yeah, I think Senate. Scott Israel needs to yeah. get used to losing because he's going to lose in the higher courts most likely and lose in the Florida Senate. This is really, this is the beginning of the camp 2020 campaign for sheriff. Right, uh -huh. and he is running again, he says. All right, yeah. thank you all for coming in. Great conversation, great roundtable. So to come, my personal perspective about political asylum, the president says it's a scam, but it is not.
take a look at your screen right there, our four-cam forecast. These are tower cams across a beautiful day in South Florida. Boy, is it ever. And here is Weather Authority meteorologist Luke Doris with the Sunday forecast. Luke. Well, South Florida, it is a beautiful Sunday, though we are on the warm side, a little humid with it too, but not much in the way of rain, just sun and clouds for us today. Similar story for tomorrow, but by Tuesday, we'll be watching for this approaching front. That's our big weather maker as far as this uh, next few days go. Today, rain chance limited to just 20%, so most of us will remain dry. We'll go to the mid 80s, but the heat index is going to be near 90 once you factor in the humidity. Humidity is getting quite high. A little east breeze at about 10 to 20, but still great to go out to the beaches today. The rip current risk is uh, moderate, so not too high. So we'll keep our temperatures fairly steady. 70% chance for showers on Tuesday. That's with a front, but no cool air behind it. Luke, thanks. All right, before we leave you today, a personal perspective about asylum and empathy. You just can't live in South Florida and not have empathy for asylum seekers. They live here among us, people who have fled oppressive regimes in their home countries and were allowed to stay in the U.S. because they proved they would be jailed or tortured or killed if they went back. Granting asylum is a sign of America's empathy and our greatness. But the president says asylum is a scam. That's what he said Friday. And yesterday in a speech in Las Vegas, he ridiculed, mocked the asylum process, pretending to be an asylum seeker and his attorney. I am very worried that I will be accosted. If I was sent back home, no, no, he'll do the accosting. Asylum. Oh, give him asylum. He's afraid. He's afraid. That is offensive on so many levels. First, this is the president of the United States mocking an established legal process that speaks to America's core values. Granting asylum is providing an act of mercy. It gives sanctuary to people who would be jailed, tortured, killed if they had to return to their home countries. And winning an asylum claim is not that easy. The Justice Department says in 2017, just 20 percent of the people who applied for asylum got it. It is not a gimme. I thought President Trump hit the nadir when he mocked a Washington Post reporter with disabilities. Well, I think he has sunk to that level again with his mockery of an asylum seeker and his or her attorney. No, Mr. President, we don't hand out asylum just because someone is afraid. I'd like to introduce the president to some outstanding immigration attorneys here in South Florida, people like Cheryl Little, Willie Allen, Tammy Fox Isikoff, among others. They could explain to him why asylum is part of what makes America great now and again in the future. We hear a lot of talk these days about a humanitarian crisis at the border, and yes, there is one. But there is also a humanitarian crisis at the White House with the president who lacks humanity. That is my perspective. Hope you have a great Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. And get online. You can catch any of our programs right there on local10.com. And you can also subscribe to our This Week in South Florida Roundtable podcast online. And we will see you again next Sunday. Have a great day. Stay tuned for SoFlo Health right here next.